Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's event. My name is Erica Lee. I'm director of the Immigration History Research Center at the University of Minnesota, joining you from my home office today. And we're so pleased to uh, welcome you to today's discussion. Stories from the pandemic, advocacy and resilience in Black immigrant and refugee communities. This is the result of the Immigration History Research Center's Immigrants in COVID America project. This is a digital project that we began at the height of the pandemic, summer of 2020. It documents the health and economic and social impact of COVID-19 on immigrants and refugees in the United States. Our goal has been to create a digital record of the crisis to provide a publicly accessible resource for emerging teaching and research and learning, creative work, and to be able to advocate for um, equity inclusion um, in health matters, as well as all of the other aspects that the pandemic has, um, has had on our lives. We've also partnered with the Sahan Journal, which is a nonprofit digital newsroom located here in Minnesota, dedicated to providing authentic news reporting for and about immigrants and refugees. And with the Sahan Journal, we've been so lucky to partner with journalist Ibrahim Hersey uh, to support the creation of digital stories documenting the experiences of immigrants and refugees during the pandemic. You can find all of the stories that we've covered online uh, under the project name Stories from the Pandemic. And today's discussion brings Ibrahim together with three of our amazing storytellers and community leaders to share their experiences with us. So before we launch into the discussion and before we get Ibrahim onto the Zoom stage, I wanted to highlight a few housekeeping items. First, this webinar is being recorded so that we can share it with our larger communities um, after the event, but also so that the question and answer portion can happen via the Q&A uh, function that's at the bottom of your Zoom window. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation, um, but we'll turn to the audience questions at the end of the program. You can choose to submit questions anonymously if you do not want your name to be mentioned when the question is posted. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce today's event moderator, Ibrahim Hersey. Ibrahim is a journalist and a PhD candidate at the University of Minnesota's History Department where he teaches and studies US immigration history and the black diaspora. He's written for The Nation, Sahan Journal and many other publications. His most recent column for The Nation, for example, was just published a few weeks ago, titled America's Long History of Mistreating Haitian Migrants. Ibrahim, welcome. Thank you so much for all of the stories you've written for our project and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Professor Erica Lee, for the introduction. Um, it's an honor to be back here to explore with you all the experiences of immigrants and refugee communities in Minnesota. I'll begin with brief introductions of the panelists. Nalima Sitati Monene is the Executive Director of the African Career Education and Research Inc. The organization has been serving immigrant communities in the northwestern suburbs of the Twin Cities since 2008. When the COVID-19 pandemic took hold in Minnesota, Nalima and her organization rose to the occasion, helping hundreds of people who struggled to pay their rent and buy food. Maryam Mohammed is a teacher children is author and a mother. Her books explore the challenges and experiences of immigrant and Muslim children who are coming of age in the US. During the first few weeks of the pandemic, amid the chaos and confusion of virtual learning, Maryam observed her students go through emotional distress. Oftentimes she had to put teaching aside to focus 
on a student's emotional health. And finally, Honey Jacobson is a community, uh, community health and wellness nurse in St. Cloud. From the start of the pandemic, she has made it her mission to educate the East African community about social distancing and to disseminate um, accurate information about COVID vaccines. Hani has received public recognition for this work, including a 2020 Virginia uh, McKnight Binger and Song Hero Award. Nalima, Miriam, and Hani, thank you for being here with us. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to be in conversation with you this evening. Um, before we start talking about uh, the impact that the, the, that the pandemic has had on our immigrant and refugee populations, I wanted to get a, you know, a background information, uh, a little bit about your background, how you got into this work. So Nalima, I'll start with you. Um, could you tell us about how you became interested in the nonprofit world and in serving Black immigrant and refugee populations in the state? Oh, thank you very much, uh, Ibrahim. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in the company of Mariam and Hani, such uh, wonderful folks from the community. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, so how did I get involved in nonprofit work? I don't think I really sought out to necessarily work in the nonprofit field. I was more, uh, I am an organizer. That's what I consider myself to. I like to organize people, organize resources, organize money to get it to where it needs to be. And how I got into this work was really, uh, you know, out of interest in, you know, in seeing that uh, become a reality. And especially, um, I live in Brooklyn Park now. When I moved to Brooklyn Park, I realized that it was really different from the neighborhood. I moved to Brooklyn Park because I wanted, to, uh, you know, my kids to grow up in a more diverse community when I had kids. But when I moved here, it was also, there was also a stark difference from, you know, the city I had moved from. And so it was really curiosity that led me to the work that I do today. I was really curious to know why do communities look different? Why do resources flow differently, you know, amongst other people and among other communities than, um, than in other places? And uh, is it that people don't know? And so my organization, the African Career Education and Resources Inc was founded in 2008. I am not one of the founders, but ASA was founded out of the need to connect uh, communities, especially the African immigrant community, and uh, who are growing in the northwestern suburbs in the nine, you know, in the early two thousands, and nobody was really noticing, and so there was a disconnect between, you know, resources, uh, between resources and people not being able to reach them, and so yeah, that is how I came into this work. It was more out of curiosity and wanting to connect people uh, you know, to resources, but not just connect people to resources, but to uh, ask the question in my organization, we ask the question, what are the root causes of, you know, of deficiencies in our community and how do we address them so that we can come up with long-term sustainable uh, solutions? That is where my interest really lies. Yeah, no, that's really good. Thank you very much. Uh, and Miriam, I, you know, you are an elementary school teacher uh, you have written three books. Um, how did you come about? I mean, you know, how did you um, end up uh, becoming both a teacher and a writer at the same time? Yeah, well, um, when I first immigrated with my family to the States, we originally landed in New York. And then shortly after, we decided to immigrate to Texas. Um, Originally, writing was more of like a tool for me, like the better I would get at it and the more I would perfect my craft, um, the sooner I could get out of my ESL services that I was receiving. I was a little embarrassed to receive um, English as a second language, they used to call it. Now it's ELL. Um, so yeah, that was low key how it kind of how it started. But um, after some time and after um, spending quality time by myself, just reading books and trying to get more into literature, I honestly fell in love and I've never looked back since. Um, I just think it's really beautiful that you can just form a thought and then that leads to a story and that develops characters and then 
you can do whatever you want with that. Um, so yeah, I fell in love with that. So I discovered around third grade, that's when I really love to write books. Um, and that's what I thought I would do forever. Um, but then teaching, I didn't think I could do both. With teaching, um, I would be translating documents for my parents and um, studying, helping my mother study for her citizenship test. Because if she becomes a citizen, then we all become the citizen. So it was kind of a group effort. Um, so that kind of, whenever I would see my mom, like just like a spark in her, she would get excited to learn something new. As a kid, I was like, I love this. So then I would educate my younger siblings and um, my older brothers worked. So I was left as the oldest um, in the house. So I would be helping my younger siblings read and write and math. So I fell in love with teaching then. Um, growing up, I, I honestly did not think I could do both. I thought I had to choose. That's why it took me a little longer to get into writing. But now this is what I do. <laughs> Thank you, and you have written, you know, three books with that. We will come back for that. But Hani, I uh, wanted to check in with you. Um, I know that we had a conversation in the past. Um, you obviously are, you know, from Somalia in refugee camps, but then you settled you with your family in Atlanta, and then you moved from Atlanta early two thousands um, in Saint Cloud, and uh, you first worked as a, in, an, an interpreter but eventually you ended up going to uh, uh, nursing school and to become the nurse that you are today. Uh, a little bit of how did that shift that, you know, that shift happened and, and, and why was the reason why you decided I, I wanted to become a nurse? Um, yeah, hi, Ibrahim and fellow panelists. Um, thank you for having us here today and thank you for that um, kind introduction. Uh, my journey to community health actually started when I was a little girl watching my mom in the refugee camp take care of people, um, basically with little to nothing. By the time I was in high school, like so many other immigrant children, I was managing the health and well-being of my entire family. I mean, as immigrant children, that's something we're kind of expected to do, right? You're supposed to help the whole family, um, as Miriam and um, Nalima had mentioned earlier. Um, I moved to St. Cloud in 2005. Uh, when I moved here, I saw a need for more interpreters. And um, at that time, we had an influx of new Somali refugee families here. And I was looking for a job and I saw the need, so I started doing that work. Besides needing interpreter services, I also noticed that um, our new families needed someone to advocate for them. They face discrimination, Islamophobia, and other social disparities that come with a language and cultural barriers, just like my family and so many others that had come earlier faced, right? That's when I thought I can put my love for community health and advocacy together. And really that's why I became a nurse. Since then, I preach the importance of community health and health equity. And for the first time, I think um, I, I feel like some health systems and organizations are making this work a priority, which has made my job you know, a little easier. Um, and in all of my roles, you know, whether I was an interpreter, community organizer, or a nurse, I, I sought out opportunities to improve the health and well being of our communities um, beyond our facilities and clinics and hospitals, right? Because we know that's where health happens. Health happens in our communities. It, ha it happens in our neighborhoods where we play, where we go to school and um, et cetera. So basically I took the time to educate our refugee families about the health system, how things work, something as simple as you know appointments or uh, making an appointment, asking questions. Um, empowering people that you have the right to, you know, ask questions and whatever your doctor or your nurse says is not the final decision that you have the right to learn more about your health care and you are part of your care. Um, you're a participating member of your um, health care and services. Um, I also took this time to talk to doctors, nurses, and staff about health disparities and social determinants of health, because that's something that we don't often talk about in the clinics or at the hospital. Um, my favorite part about my work is the um, advocacy work that I get to do for our BIPOC communities, mainly because complete strangers advocated for me and my family when we first came to the U.S. nearly 30 years ago. 
And yeah, I truly love what I do. I get to combine my love for community health and advocacy and continue to, to do the work that I do. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and Nalima, I wanted to come back to you and give our audience uh, an opportunity to get to know a little bit more about ACER. Uh, what service does you know, the, the organization provide? And also how has the pandemic shifted uh, you know, the work that you and, and, and ACER do? I know that many organizations and many individuals had to shift um, their work to um, adopt what was you know, the need that, 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 that a lot of people um, sought. Uh, what was it like for you during the pandemic, but a little bit about the uh, ACER as well. Sure. So ACER is the African Career Education and Resources Inc. And we're an issue-based organization. And we're, we're a grassroots community organization and we're issue-based. And that means that at any given time, we're working to address issues that our communities have prioritized as being as important to them. And um, at the... Uh, what drives our work is organizing. So we're either organizing people, organizing around issues, organizing, uh, you know, to transform systems, organizing money, organizing resources to get resources to into our communities. And uh, we employ three strategies to do that at work. We do it through community uh, organizing. We organize people. Uh, in our communities to address issues that impact them. We do it through advocacy. So we move policy agendas. We're a 501c3. Uh, we're not in those candidates, but we definitely do a lot of civic engagement, outreach, voter registration, and we move policy agendas so that uh, we can come up with better policies to uh, to serve our, our communities better. And then we also do that through education. And that's a two-way street. We educate our communities about issues that are important to them, but we also do a lot of education to the systems that impact our communities. And with our goal of systemic transformation is what we're aiming for. We know the systems are not designed with our communities in mind. And so we work to transform the system so that they can serve our communities uh, better and so our four main buckets of work right now are in the areas of civic engagement and democratic participation uh housing justice we do a lot of tenant organizing that is where a lot of our community members are and in the housing work we talk a lot about affordable housing and every other thing and home ownership is important but a lot of times we don't talk about renters rights and so there's just not that investment a lot of investment uh you know, in our communities among the tenants. And uh, economic development is a big part of our work. We do a lot of, of a technical assistance to micro businesses and emphasis on micro because that is where a lot of our communities are. A lot of people talk about small businesses, but our communities are really micro businesses. A lot of them are grossing $60,000 and under. It's a lot of folks replaced their nine to five to operate those businesses. And a lot of times they are left out in the guidelines for who gets resources, uh, you know, for small businesses. So we believe in community wealth building, not just uh, having a job or making an income, but we, our goal is to build wealth in our community so that we can begin to build generational wealth in our community. And then health equity is another big bucket of our work. And uh, all the other pieces of our work, in addition to clinical health, address the social determinants of health. So that is really the nexus around which we do our work because our goal is to, is to build healthy, holistic, uh, holistic communities. So during the pandemic, how did our work shift? I think, um, we're not necessarily a direct service organization, but how our work shifted is we knew that the people we were organizing and working with, uh, people were having to make a choice, especially among our tenant leaders that we're talking to between putting food on the table and paying their rent. And so that was, uh, and we said that was not acceptable. And so we did a lot of mutual aid, uh, you know, services just a lot, just like a lot of other communities. I mean, I think we've always said in our communities that the people who are most impacted have the best solutions to address the situation. And so we view us, ourselves as a catalyst, as a resource for people to increase people's agencies. But we do know that the people in our community are well equipped to come up with solutions that are best for them. All we need is all they need is resources and an opportunity to be at the table and the agency to be able to determine, you know, their destiny and their future. And so we talked to a lot of our community members and we ran a lot of mutual aid uh, stations like putting food, uh, you know, food, doing food drives. 
uh, you know, we raised funds from individuals and in, uh, in GoFundMe pages to help people pay their rent, et cetera. And then also started looking into some long-term solutions. And so we were engaged in various campaigns, especially to protect, you know, the tenants in our community, a lot of whom are already housing cost burden, just spending easily 50% and over of their income just to pay rent. And we're in a situation where people were had to stay home and could not work. We had to shelter in place and people's housing was in jeopardy. So we were able to move some very uh, quick, fast and aggressive campaigns to put in place an eviction moratorium that would ensure that people uh, do not lose their housing. But and beyond that, also really started advocating very heavily for, you know, rental assistance so that people not only could uh, that allow people to stay in place, but we didn't want people to have huge debt after, you know, after the shelter in place, you know, has come and gone. So we wanted to make sure that people had resources to be able to pay their back rent or do another risk of eviction. And I mean, I think we all know that the pandemic definitely exacerbated the problems that our communities have, but we all know that these issues are systemic and the one not new, as we've been saying for a long time, what the pandemic did was really blow the cover off uh, from these issues that we have been talking about uh, you know, for a long time. So whereas the pandemic is, is devastating and we're still feeling that our communities are still feeling the impacts of the pandemic. And I think we'll continue to feel it for a while. We're just very disproportionately impacted but I think where work has shifted is I think we have become, you know, more aggressive in our push. And we hope that, I mean, you know, we were able to put in place some very creative strategies that the system was able to agree to. And I think our biggest thing right now as we move forward, how our work has also shifted, is really trying to maintain those creative solutions that we came up with. We don't want people to go back to the status quo. I mean, we did a lot of things like transforming the rental assistance, you know, uh, in Minnesota, which has never worked in the way it is, you know, it is working right now. So those are some of the things that we're trying to focus on. And I mean, you know, the funds that have been powered, the, the micro businesses, you know, highlighting micro businesses are a significant part of our economic engine and making sure that we don't fall back to the status quo, but that these real resources, not just emergency resources, but real sustainable resources continue to stay in the creative solutions that communities came up with. Yeah, no, that's really good. And 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 you know, obviously, ICER serves um, all Black immigrant communities, but majority of the folks who live in um, Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center, happen to be West Africans for the most part. Even though we're seeing a larger growth of other communities too in in, in Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center. Uh, I will come back to you, uh, Nalima. That's really great. Thank you. Uh, but Miriam, I wanted to check in with you about. Uh, now, you know, we're no longer in, in lockdown and people have gone back to schools. Um, and I know that you are in your classroom at, the, at this time. Um, but, but during the, the pandemic, I wanted to understand a little bit. And I know that we mentioned this in our story, the story that we, that we published uh, as part of the story from the, from the pandemic project. Uh, but first time, you know, when I heard of young students um, uh, are, 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 are being taught virtually, um, I wasn't sure because I know that many of the students that you serve are coming from low income families. Some of them don't really have access to internet. Some of them don't probably have um, um, computers at home. Um, how did that happen? Um, and uh, what were some of the challenges that you had to face in teaching these kids virtually? Yeah, so um, we are a Title I school, meaning all of our students receive free lunch. It's not even free or reduced. It's free lunch. Um, and resources are limited. But I will say that um, when we first went virtual, it was a very scary thought. It was it was just like an all of a sudden kind of thing. There was no preparation. Nobody knew what was to be expected or what would happen next. So in a way, everybody just went into panic mode. And we were told starting next week, you're going to be teaching online. And um, teachers as well as students, we just, um, we went into survival mode. And although um, the students really, really pushed through and we've learned um, truly when you were tested, how far we're willing to go in order to educate our students. 
Um, I've made TikToks, <laughs> I've never made TikToks before, but engagement was really lacking and we had to do whatever we had to do in order to keep our students engaged and um, make sure they were learning. Um, and the, our biggest, well, I'll speak for myself, my biggest struggle as a teacher during the pandemic was, um, like I said, engagement. In the classroom, you can control the setting. You can control what kind of environment you provide. And we make sure there's no distractions. It's kind of calm. Um, and we set our students up for success. Not to say that wasn't happening at home by any means, um, but it's harder when you have several siblings who sh might share the same learning space. Or if, like you said, there's no internet or um, what was another thing that uh, was that kept happening? Oh yeah, many students did not want it to turn on their cameras because privacy. They did not want us to see their living space for what for whatever reason. It could just be that they were shy. But I've had students voice concerns that I, I don't want anybody to see my room or I they like they were hiding a lot. So just overcoming all of those obstacles as a teacher and try to make students feel as comfortable as possible was tricky because it was new territory for us. Um, but the students truly have shown resilience and they've pushed through and um, it made us all better tech wise. Uh, I can do a lot more than I could ha couldn't have in the past. And yeah, honestly, it was, it, we're still recovering, believe it or not. Uh, even though we are back in person right now, um, think about it, your average second grader right now probably hasn't been in school since kindergarten. So we're, your second grader is like around the same level, uh, their emotional, social well-being as a kindergartner. So we're still picking up the damage from that and um, just doing the best we can with as much resources that we have. And I will say my district, we are blessed. Um, we have had the community really step up and Every student has a Chromebook now and they have access to internet if they need it. Um, so that has been, in a way, made us stronger as a community. Yeah, no, that's really good. And I know that, I mean, a lot of people would be, would, would say, you know, it, it, this is not really unique because um, many uh, uh, students have to go through the same process, you know, people had to be locked down in their homes, but I think the difference with 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 our population, the population that we're talking about, are number one, you're talking about sixth graders, not college students, uh, but also people who may not have the support that other parents may have. You know, parents who don't speak the language, parents who are coming from low-income families, parents who are also hustling and, and trying to work as their students um, and struggle at home. And I know that you know you talked about how um, students were kind of coming together and helping each other. And that's a question that we will come back. But I wanted to check in with uh, Hany. Um, Hany, you also had to shift uh, your work. Uh, I know that you were uh, a nurse working at the hospitals, but then around the same time, you had a different job that you thought you were gonna do something different, but then all of a sudden you had to change things around. Uh, walk us through that uh, process. Yeah, so, um... Prior to COVID, our focus was to promote health and wellness in our communities. Um, specifically, our team uh, focused on marginalized communities. Um, our team was leading to create and implement um, health and wellness through educational programming. Our goal was to change uh, policies, systems, and structural barriers that have been there for generations. Uh, we collaborated with, you know, other community organizations to learn the health needs of um, central Minnesota minorities. Uh, we did, um, we conducted polls, surveys, uh, we went to communities, uh, we observed um, different things, we interviewed our community members regarding uh, food insecurity, housing, education, and their thoughts on preventative health, right, because preventative health did not exist in where we came from or in the refugee camp. So that was a new concept that was new to our community. Um, so basically I was in the business of promoting health and wellness that is culturally and linguistically appropriate. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis on promoting health seeking be behaviors in our uh, BIPOC communities. 
um, and also to ensure easy access for health. We looked for barriers when it comes to making appointments, um, how friendly the front desk staff were. I mean, we have so many different clinics. Um, sometimes, you know, we'd visit different uh, facilities just to make sure that it's welcoming environment for every single person that walked through those doors. So we thought, you know, by providing uh, family-centered community health programs to communities experiencing um, severe health disparities, the hope was to bridge the health equity gap. Um, so then when COVID came, it kind of derailed a lot of that work. Um, we noticed that there was a communication and information balance. Um, all of a sudden, everything was done online. Uh, doctor's visits were online, um, COVID updates were online. I mean, you had to go to our central care website, which then you clicked and it led you to MDH or the CDC, um, educational materials, literally everything went online. And we know we have a technology disparity, um, language and cultural barriers in many of our communities that my team serves. Um, so we knew we had to do something different. We had to figure out a way to get them the information that they needed to keep themselves and their families safe. Uh, there was a lot of confusion about COVID-19 for everybody. So you can only imagine what that meant for um, our refugee and immigrant population. Um, some of our refugee family members or community members were literally experiencing PTSD from wartime, um, including my own family. Uh, you saw that food and supplies were flying off the shelves, increasing their anxiety and fears um, of basically what they had gone through once upon a time, right? That's when we decided, you know, we had to partner up with community leaders, um, local Somali TV and radio, local mosque leaders to disperse accurate information because there was all kinds of things happening, including that we had to migrate again to Canada as if they didn't have a pandemic, right? Um, so we also visited uh, refugee-owned stores, um, apartment buildings, because you know we're communal, we like to live in groups, uh, multi-generational households, community spaces, um, and then we provided uh, COVID education that was culturally and linguistically responsive. Um, our team focused on community empowerment and engagement, uh, engagement. We distributed education and um, tools such as masks, hand sanitizers, um, flyers in buildings and things like that, that families needed to stay safe and also to just stay calm to decrease that anxiety level that, you know, a lot of people were afraid of. Um, so basically, we built a lot of partnerships and relationships during that time. And now we are using those relationships that we built early on in the pandemic for COVID vaccination work. Our work has shifted to COVID vaccination work. Um, we have been, been able to go to schools, mosques, churches, different neighborhoods to make COVID, act, uh, COVID vaccine access easier. Um, keep in mind, this is work in progress. Um, every day we're making a little bit of improvement and gaining people's trust in order for them to um, keep themselves and their families safe. So the work I got hired for has shifted a little bit since the pandemic, but we're forming new relationships, new bridges, and new ways of doing things. Super exciting stuff. Yeah, no, that's really good. And I wanted to remind um, our audience that uh, we will be uh, shifting to the Q&A questions in, in, a, in a few minutes. So uh, get ready uh, your questions and maybe you can put in the chat um, once time in about five or seven minutes. Um, I wanted to um, ask this question that I've been thinking about since I, I think I first interviewed with Miriam back in January uh, this year. Um, the story of Miriam was basically about the experience that she just talked about, uh, what, it, what it meant for her to teach uh, young children um, virtually. And she mentioned this one line, you know, this one idea that really stuck with me uh, for a long time. And that was young students, um, uh, you know, helping their, their younger siblings, you know, siblings helping siblings when uh, they needed help, um, whether it's uh, tech issues or, you know, math problems, 
because as you all know, you know, Marion is watching them on the screen, but she can't really check in uh, and, and to provide that help. So I, I just, I, that just is talk with me. I mean, young people understanding the challenge that uh, the world is facing and saying, look, my brother is st struggling there or my sister is struggling there. I'm going to go and walk to her and, and help her with whatever help she needs. And that's what Miriam watched um, through her screen. Um, and that's, I think, you know, the definition of resilience. Uh, we're not talking about, you know, adults, uh, uh, but, but here are younger people really uh, being very resilient. And I wanted to check in with you about the stories of resilience that you can share with us through your work, what did you see um, in, in, in your communities? Not necessarily the, the work that you provide, but what you've seen, uh, what, you, what, what you have seen in the community to do. And I'm going to start with uh, Hani. Hani, can you think of any experience of a resilience where you, you found people uh, uh, stand up for, for one another? Yeah, so... Um... The last year and a half, you know, healthcare providers around the wor world have been challenged, um, you know, in ways that I've never been prepared for. Um, I feel like no amount of um, training could have prepared me for what we had to face, right? Um, so to add to the matter, we also had racial and political unrest. I mean, I truly felt like we were going through a civil war. There were times that the little refugee girl inside of me was scared and afraid of the unknown because things were changing so quickly from day to day. But our community came together, you know, we worked as a team, we found resilience in each other. Um, healthcare workers just showed up to take care of our communities. Our team stayed strong, even when things were falling apart sometimes. And what gave me hope was the support and encouragement from complete strangers. I had cards dropped off in my mailbox. Um, people were bringing us meals. Um, our community was in this together and you really felt that. The compassion and the kindness that we received from people was so intense. And that's something that I will never forget. Um, I found a stronger sense of purpose towards community health and specifically health equity, right? And um, the love, that we received gave me the energy to keep going and forced me to think outside of the box. Cause at times you were like, well, I cannot really go back to the old ways that we used to do things. It was in those moments of despair that really helped me become innovative. My favorite story actually came recently in April of 2021. Um, we went to one of our local mosques to vaccinate our refugee community. It was um, right Literally, it was like the week before Ramadan, I believe. And people were so excited to come back to the mosque because they weren't able to come and pray together any, for a long, long time. So the goal here was to make um, the vaccine access easier by providing it in a space and time that was comfortable, that was convenient for our community members. So an older Somali man came up to me and he was like, I like he couldn't see my face. I was wearing a hijab and a mask and my glasses like he had no idea who I was. And he was like, I recognize your voice from the radio. And he said, I look forward to hearing COVID and health updates on their daily. You know, the, the work that you and your team are doing has provided us a lot of sense of calmness to have the information that we need to do what we need to do. Um, he was so grateful and seeing all the smiles on our elderly who were excited for Ramadan and new beginnings and the vaccine was just so priceless. Um, and when they learned that they could get vaccinated, they can come to Friday prayers and not only Friday, but also Tarawih prayers um, for them and the, uh, their families, you could almost hear a collective sigh in the room. And at that moment, it just reassured me that I'm, I'm, we are doing the right thing. Our team is doing the right thing and to keep going. So yeah, that's, that was my favorite yeah, that's, story. Yeah, no, that's really powerful. And we will come back uh, to this uh, question of resilience. Um, I think we're running out of time, but I wanted to give Miriam an opportunity to answer a question about uh, her books. We mentioned that, that she has written, uh, Miriam, we mentioned that you have written about three books. Um, for, to the audience that, that hasn't, you know, seen your book yet, 
what kind of stuff do you write about? What are these uh, three books very briefly um, are about? Okay, yeah, so um, my three books, my first one was about Aya's Golden Rule, and that's just about a young nine-year-old girl named Yasmin who immigrates to the United States and just the, everything that I went through is a semi-autobiography, but it is based off of a student that I've observed, but it was so similar what I went through is very similar to what the student went through. So I wrote about it. Um, and then I wrote about book that deals with autism and addresses that because um, unfortunately, sometimes it's frowned upon and we don't speak about it um, and advocate for students with uh, or children with different abilities or disabilities. And then the last one is just about Eid al-Adha, which is a major holiday for Muslim people. So my books just are surround and um, talk about uh, experiences that um, I could relate to and people who might look like me relate to, as well as bridge that gap for um, other people and white people, black people, Latinos, Hmong, everybody can kind of learn about my culture and my experiences because too often I've grown up learning about everybody else's culture but mine and it led me to not appreciate where I come from. So I'm trying to make a difference and write about books that um, represent characters who might resemble me. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's really yeah. that's very powerful. Yeah, I mean, I've seen uh, a number of people. I've done, you know, I've done a few stories about the young people like you are writing about their experience, um, and many people shared that you know, growing up when they were 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they never really had any book that uh, that they saw themselves in. So I'm glad you are here um, telling our kids uh, that their stories matter and they can see their, themselves in books. Um, I uh, wanted to, let me see, um, ask um, Hany, uh, I know that you, know, you already talked a little bit about this, but, but, but I think with COVID uh, vaccines, um, th th there was a, a challenge, especially, especially when I was talking to you, there was a lot of uh, you know uh, misinformation about the vaccinations, and this is really I think very important because um, uh, it was just terrible. I mean the way that you you put it, and, and I think you can read that that in the story. But how you know, after a few years? I mean that was in March that when we published this story. Several months later, how has it been in terms of are people now understanding the importance of vaccinations? Are people getting their vaccines? or the situation is kind of still the same? Um, well, we have made a very big improvement from the last time I talked to you, right? Last time it was so new, um, you know, it was uh, something that, you know, the whole country was trying to gather first, right? Um, you know, I've, I, I don't know if you remember, but I told you people were saying, you know, it causes infertility, it causes health issues to men, it, um, we're gonna turn into zombies. It's not made for us. You know, black and refugees are getting a different shot than all the other people, like the celebrities and the politicians that were on TV. I do wanna say though, you know, we've worked a lot with building our relationships, right? That's the whole purpose of our team is to build relationships and um, that helped us. But when we, we give a lot of Johnson & Johnson literally the day before they uh, put a pause on it, and that kind of put, put, our, um, put us back a little bit, but things are getting better. And, and, you know, having the support of our community leaders, the mosque support has been very helpful in our efforts to vaccinate everyone that's eligible. Yeah, no, that's really good. I wanted to turn it over to uh, Professor Eric Lee, um, who will check in with the uh, um, audience Q&A, uh, but also these questions, I think we can continue with um, um, a little later. Now we have about 15 minutes and I wanna make sure uh, people, you know, to respect other people's time as well. So Erica, please take it over. Of course, first of all, this is such a wonderful conversation. I think so many of us could, we feel like we're just getting started. There's so many more things to um, to ask, but we we do have um, a few questions that have come in from the audience, and I want to invite um, all who are with us to to pose a question if you wish. 
Um, and this is a question that um, asks all of the panelists to, um, to think about how the pandemic response has inspired students, patients, and younger colleagues to share thoughts about how they would handle a, this, a similar crisis the next time. You know, so what, what are lessons that we have learned about um, how we can prepare our communities, our professions, our networks, our institutions um, to do better in the future, including maybe even next week because we're still in this, um, but also next time. So can you think about this question from your perspective as an activist, a teacher, a healthcare worker, et cetera? Um, and perhaps I, I might start with, with Nilima. What can we do better next time? Oh, thank you, Dr. Lee. I think uh, I said before, um, you know, the work that we do has always, uh, my organization has always been about systemic change. I think it has never been a secret that, you know, the systems are not working well for our communities. And there's a reason why we have disparities. And, you know, unfortunately, when the pandemic broke out, we could predict from the very beginning what was going to happen. And, and, and that was unfortunate. You know, anytime we're able to predict what is going to happen to a certain population of people just based on their race, their income, where, you know, what their zip code is, where they live, where they go to school, it is very unfortunate. And I think one of the things that um, can help us to prepare uh, better next time is to really address the issues that are at hand. And it's not so much the pandemic, it's, uh, you know, why were, were certain people able to weather the pandemic better than others? Why could we predict what is going to happen to communities of color, disenfranchised, uh, you know, disenfranchised communities beforehand? So that is the real conversation that, you know, we need to be happening. We've always had health disparities, you know, and uh, we've always had housing insecurity in Minnesota. You know, we've always been housing insecure. The housing issue that people are talking about right now that everybody's talking about. I've been a housing advocate forever. And, you know, nobody believed we had a housing crisis, but we've always had a housing crisis. It's not the pandemic exacerbated the housing crisis, but it not caused the housing crisis because we just don't have, we have never put in place the right funding and resources and infrastructure that can enable people to weather emergencies. We have always said there are people who cannot afford to have an emergency at all. And we know who those, uh, who those people are. And so how do we prepare better? Uh, we need to advance equity, you know, so that everybody can be able to uh, to to face an emergency situation, and so that we're not so we do not have this, you know, this indicators that can already predict how badly people are going to, you know, are going to do in the case of an emergency or even without an emergency. Thank you, um, Miriam. What about? Um... What about what you're seeing in the schools? What, what lessons have we learned in the past 18 months? Um, or are we still in a state of, of chaos and, and constant um, need for flexibility? Yeah, it's definitely, if I'm brutally honest, it's still in that chaos stage because we're dealing with the aftermath. Um, and honestly, we've learned now more than ever from what I've learned from the students is that we don't take any days for granted because we don't know what tomorrow might look like. And I feel like my students have taught me that because each day they are here, they're putting in 110%. Um, I love how I have the best connection and um, with parents now more than ever, we've formed a bond, the parents, the students, that's what makes me the most happiest is that we've learned that we are stronger together through this pandemic. And although it's interesting, it's ironic how we'll be separated if it happens again, I feel like in a way we're closer, if that makes sense, uh, virtually. We are ready to go if it, if it does happen again. We have internet ready. Um, we will provide Chromebooks like we have. We've learned from the past that was a need. So we have that taken care of this time around. And naturally as teachers, honestly, there could be, we are trained to just like improvise. 
something happens, we just we just make it up and we go as long because the students can't just be bored for two seconds or it's going to be chaos. <laughs> so you have to be quick on your feet. And I feel like that really helped through this pandemic. And yeah, I, for some strange reason, I feel prepared if it does happen. I think, I think we're ready. I think we can, we can, I pray it doesn't. And I really hope that we don't go back to virtual because um, it's devastating, but it's, if it needs to happen, so be it. But I think we'll be ready if that were to happen. As a parent um, myself, I, I'm sure that one of the reasons why the parents feel so much closer to their children's teachers is because they appreciate <laughs> they appreciate you so much more because they were having to do some of that home teaching um, themselves. I, I do know that in Minneapolis, at least, um, we have a teacher shortage, a huge teacher shortage, staff shortage in, in, in our schools. And that's, that's something that I, I really worry about. I know also in, in the healthcare county. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking about how important it is to have professionals in these vocations in these professions that represent the community and how so many of our communities cannot afford to lose anybody and so that that might place extra pressure as well um, on on all of you so um Hanny, what what do you see as some of the lessons that that you've learned in your own work but also um what what are what are you still perhaps um you know anxious about uh, concerned about whether whether uh we we can you know whether another um another pandemic right um you know some of the biggest things i've learned is that um particularly our refugee families are some of the most resilient people out there right they've been through the trenches before, right? They, they know about wartime, they experienced refugee camp life um, and, and coming here was like a dream come true. So they're willing to put in the extra work to make it through this pandemic and step forward. And um, something that I've also learned is that, you know, I've been helping a lot of younger people become advocates. You don't have to be a certain age. You don't have to have a fancy degree to advocate for yourself and your families. What I saw is, you know, a lot of um, the beginning of the pandemic, we had a lot of refugee people and uh, refugee patients in our hospitals whose family couldn't visit them, right? That no one could see them. Some died alone. But the amount of advocacy that I saw in our community and the collectiveness that I witnessed has inspired me. Uh, so much just to see complete st strangers being there for each other. Um, that's something that's so inspiring about our refugee communities. I know that um, within the Asian American community this past year has been especially, it's been one filled with lots of hate and, and, and violence. And I have also found great inspiration from a resurgence of activism, especially amongst uh, the younger generation. And I'm not just talking college age, but I'd say, you know, middle school um, students as well. Um, and that has been, that, you know, that, that will, I think, be a game changer because I, I think that there's a new, a newer, younger generation that has experienced so much in the past few years, especially here in the Twin Cities that um, they have been scarred, but also battle scarred, you know, they, they've been activated. Um, and I, I hope that, um, I hope that that carries them and all of us through. Um, I, I guess I wanted to end with one last question for, for everybody. And that is about extending the, the question of advocacy. So there's 
been a great amount of advocacy from within our own communities, but what can we all do? What can we all do um, as we're thinking about the struggles for housing, struggles in school and struggles in healthcare, including and especially the persistent question of equity, not just struggles, but equity. How, how can we all advocate? Is there, a, um, is there an organization that you would recommend that we keep our eye on, including the ones that you represent? Are there uh, particular spokespersons, um, particular books? You know, what, what can we do as we close out this event to continue the conversation, to continue our own education, but also advocacy? Um, and I think I'm going to go in the same order, Nalima, Mariam, and then and then Hani will will close us out. So Nalima, what what um, what might you suggest for all of us? Um, I think if there's anything that I have learned uh, the most or been reminded the most is that everybody has the ability to do something. I think uh, when the pandemic first broke out. Um, I think there were no systems in place. There were no solutions. Community members are the ones who were out in the forefront, you know, coming up with solutions. People knew how to take care of themselves. People knew how to come together and come up with all this very innovative, uh, you know, solutions so that we were able, so that we were all able to survive right, you know, um, and to survive, you know, and to survive together, you know, from the mutual aids. I mean, people had running lists all over the place. People knew where to get diapers, you know, uh, you know, for the little kids and for the moms, et cetera. I think there was, so community created all these resources in the, in the beginning when there was scarcity. I mean, I think there's a Facebook page for everything, for where to find toilet paper and who had paper towels and all that stuff, right? And so it, it was just it's significant that we all need each other and everybody needs to bring what they have to the table. And I mean, and we should not lose those, you know, we should not lose those connections and that togetherness and putting our heads together to come up with some real solutions that can sustain us as a community. I think in terms of getting involved, I mean, of course, we're an advocacy organization, but um, there are many leaders in our community, right? I think we like to think of ourselves as in the work that I do, that we're a leaderful the organization I lead. We say we're a leaderful organization. I just happen to be, you know, leading it. I mean, I think our community is leaderful and everybody has different talents and can lead in different aspects of the work. But in terms of process and how decisions are made, you know, and et cetera, I think one of the things I want to encourage people is like a lot of times when we think about systemic change or the civic engagement process or where can my voice be had we really we always are waiting you know for an election or what is good, what is happening at the state legislature and what is happening you know at the federal level but we do know that you know your local government is your best bet i mean people we can all start getting involved where we are locally whether it is in your church in your mosque at your temple having conversations i mean asa is also a COVID community connector. We are charged with expanding, you know, uh, COVID testing in, in the Black community, COVID testing and vaccination. And one of the areas we've worked through are through the, are through the churches and the mosques and the temples, the women's groups in the community, the youth groups in the community. We all know where our community gathers and that's how our community gathers. So those are places where people can enact change. And those have been the best ambassadors for getting people vaccinated and getting resources to people. But I would say your city council is your best bet. Go to your city. If you've never been to a city council meeting, if you don't know who your council member is, find out who your council member is. If you don't know who your school board member is, find out who your school board member is because a lot of times the state legislature is out of reach or the federal uh, government is out of reach, but there are many decisions that get made at a local level. When we started reaching out to folks, we reached out to the city councils to say, People need food. People are having to make a decision between putting food on the table and paying their rent. And a lot of our local governments, before there was any conversation at the state le level, before we knew what the federal government was going to do, a lot of the local city councils moved in very quickly, put in money in the food shelves, and we started moving and started putting in money for rent even before the state could have a conversation about rental assistance. And so there's an opportunity for everybody to effect change, whether it's locally or through government and just finding out what is happening at your local council is a good place to start. 
That's great. Thank you so much. Miriam, what uh, do you recommend for us to be better advocates? Um, honestly, the best thing I can think of is volunteer at schools. We would love, I, and I'm sure every school would agree, um, more adults in the building, more people that the students can look up to. Um, also wash your hands, <laughs> make sure because <laughs> wear your masks because it does affect as teachers, we have our own families too. I have two kids under two, I have babies at home. So it's, it's scary, you know? So the best thing we can do if you want to keep schools open is take care of yourself. If you're sick, stay home. Um, and just when you can volunteer, join the PTO if you have kids at school because it, it does make a difference. And teachers are great, but when we get the community involved into the schools, whether they come and they do read aloud or they just come in and hang out, come see plays, it makes a world of difference. It really does. And you can tell because the students talk about it the rest of the day and they fight over who reads with this guest. <laughs> so yeah, come, come, come on in. Um, you're welcome to always come, join us. And as a volunteer who helps students with their college essays, I can totally recommend it. It's, there's no better way to get, well, first inspired. These students are so resilient. I know we may overuse that term, but when you talk with them and hear what the past year has been like for them, it's, um, it's both troubling, but also inspiring because they've come out the other side. Um, so yes, volunteer. And honey, you've got the last word. What can we do, including wearing our masks, I'm sure as a healthcare <laughs> provider, you're going to say, but what can we do to, to better advocate? Yeah, so Nalima and Miriam really said it beautifully. I, I don't know if I have anything to add to that, but I would like to just say um, advocacy work can be draining sometimes. Uh, there can be moments of hopelessness, and I want to remind um, everyone that's in the business of advocacy to take care of yourselves and take care of your families because you cannot pour from an empty cup. Um, I had an experience where I overstretched myself at one point and had to be reminded that I must take care of myself to take care of our communities. So self-care, um, community engagement, and social distancing and hand hygiene, all of those great things. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks to all of you. Thank you to Ibrahim. What a wonderful afternoon, evening of inspiration, stories of perseverance and resilience. It's really been an honor to share the Zoom stage with, with all of you. Thank you for the work that you're doing in, in the communities as well. Just a reminder to everyone who's joined us, you can read more about Nalima, Mariam, and Hani from our Stories from the Pandemic series, either on the Immigration History Research Center's website or on Sahan Journal's website. We also just published a research spotlight that's titled Identifying Obstacles to COVID-19 Vaccine Accessibility for Immigrant and POC Populations. And that is also on our um, on our Immigrants in COVID America website. Be sure to connect with us via social media or on our website for future events. And once again, thanks again for joining us. Everyone have a good night, stay well and keep safe. Thank you. So all of our attendees have left, so we can come back. Yay! <laughs> that was